So we're going to sing um, a couple of the same songs we sung this morning. This one, perhaps we should write a new verse. It says, the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to bless the Lord again. If anyone can write a verse, the sun's going down, it's still time to bless him, go for it. But it is, is it always time to bless the Lord? Again, we just thank you for everything you've done for us. We pray, Lord, you would meet with us this evening. Please just help us to see Jesus again, we pray. Amen. And again, thinking about Jesus' sacrifice, here is love vast as the ocean. Yes. 
As we listen to your word now, please fill Brian with your spirit. Please speak to us through him. And we just pray for Angela, I think it is, as she comes to read. Lord, please speak to us, we ask, for your glory's sake. Amen. Good evening. The reading tonight is from 2 Hebrews, chapter 1 to 9, 846 on the Church Bible. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a, a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Amen. Cheers, Danny, again for stepping in. <laughs> for doing the sound desk. And, and you, Josh, is it? <laughs> and Josh, thank you, Josh. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Lovely to see you all. Um, so, as a church, we go through... We, as Matt said earlier, we read the Bible together. So sometimes we say RBT, it means, it's a, is it called an anagram or 
what do you call that? Acronym. Yeah, an acronym for reading the Bible together. So every three years we go through the whole Bible. Um, usually it's a book a month. Sometimes we do two books in a month. Um, but this one we're in the book of Hebrews. And the title of this message for Hebrews 2 would be Focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. And it's an amazing comfort that you have in life, especially when the world is going so much out of order. And you say, how am I going to get through? You know, how am, I, how am I going to go forward? The answer is, if you focus on Jesus, you'll be able to go forward. You really will. Um, I don't know if you remember in the Bible when um, Jesus is walking on the water, isn't it? And uh, he goes, he sees Peter and Peter walks out on him, walks out on the water. So Peter's walking on the water as well. And he's able to do as long as his eyes on Jesus. And I think what happens in, in life if your eye get, goes off of Jesus, you, you go out of focus. You, you, you read things wrong, you read yourself wrong, you read other people wrong, um, and, and it just goes uh, pear-shaped. But the good news is, if we be as a church together, how a church is going to work, how we're going to be able to serve Jesus, how we're going to be able to live for Jesus, how you're going to be able to do the things that Jesus has called you to do, this is good news. If you fix your eyes on Jesus, you're going to be able to go forward. Um, and he's going to supply everything you need. So let me just pray for us uh, as a church. Because what I don't want us to do is say, I understand that. Because the, you can fool yourself. Because true understanding is you do it. Because you, before that, you just, uh, you just know what I've said. But if you get to the part... If you get to the end of this message and you say, I'm actually going to focus on Jesus, then you, then you understand. If you're already focused on Jesus, just keep focusing on him. Because there's going to be lots of things that's going to try and distract you. There's going to be lots of things that's going to tempt you to, to take your eyes off the Lord. Um, and you're going to have to, to keep your, your eyes focused, especially in the coming days, especially as this world um, is full of all sorts of problems and difficulties. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord God, that you have told us to fix our eyes on Jesus, Lord God. Lord God, you, some of us might say here, oh, but we can't see him. But Lord, but Lord, we can see him. That's the amazing truth. We can see him. Lord God, you have given us eyes to see Jesus. Lord God, you've given us that sense to know that he's there, Lord God. And I just thank you, Lord, that when we fix our eyes on Jesus, Lord God, Lord, you give us that strength and that help that we need, Lord God. So please help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so just, just to, before we get into it, I want to ask this question. Right now, what has got your focus? So, there's something that's got your focus, unless you're literally like walking around with your eyes closed and trying to ignore everything. Because ultimately, it's not just your, your physical eyes, isn't it? Like spiritual eyes. The, the way that you see life. Ask yourself, what's got my focus? What has got most of my attention right now? What, you know, it might be worry. You might be so worried about stuff. Um, and sometimes you worry so much. You worry as if God doesn't even care. And you, and you worry so much that, that you think it's all your responsibility. But it's got all your attention. That's the, that's the point. It's got all your attention. And I heard somebody say this question. Um, they call it the 65-year-old question. Sorry if you're above 65-year-old. You can still ask. You, you can, if you're above 65-year-old, you can still ask yourself this question now. But they call it the above 65-year-old question. In other words, or when you get to 65. In other words, when you get to 65, what you focused your attention on, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Was, did that, did, was it worth me putting all my energy into that? It might be a career you know, some people climb the ladder, don't they? And they get, you know, they, they look at their bank account and it's, it's doubling every, size, every time it, it looks at it. It's quite easy if you've got five pounds and it's doubling to 10 pounds, isn't it? But if it, you know, if that's your focus and your attention, but when you get to 65, if you get to 65, was it, is it worth it? Is what you're willing to put your energy in now? And, and I think God is saying to you, like, have the sense, have that sense to know that Jesus is going to be worth it. Jesus is worth it. And, 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 and the Lord has maybe been speaking to you of who he is, showing you who he is. And he's been saying to you, can't you see it? it's going to be worth it? If you are willing to say, right, I'm going to look to Jesus. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to 
you know, seek him. I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to give, I'm going to serve him with all of my life. And he, the Lord is ultimately saying to you, have the heart to know that it's going to be worth it. There's going to be many things that's going to oppose that. But there's many things that will oppose that in your heart. And you're going to have to constantly refocus. You're going to have to constantly refocus on Jesus. There might be something in your own heart that goes wrong. Bitterness, unforgiveness, and you're going to have to refocus. There might be something that happens outside. Even, you know, Jesus actually talks about you have to even focus on Jesus even above your own family members. Because your own family members could, could pull you away and you've got to say, no, I've got to, I've got to focus on Jesus. Um, just to give you an illustration, just to help us, there's some things in, in life that helps you get focused. So we were, some of us were helping somebody move house the other day, okay? We had to help somebody move house. And when you were moving house, there was actually... There was three people moving house on one day. So the one person was going into one house, the other person was going into the other house, and the other person, this is a true story, and another person was going into the other house. But what it did, because there was so much movement, because of the things, these were moving things, it focused your attention. Because you're like, I've, I've, got to, I've got to be in the right place because it's, hap- it's coming, that move is happening today. And I think there's a truth here with Jesus. It's in this is what, this is what it's about. You're told, this is what it's about. It's about Jesus. And I'm going to, and I'm going to let this whole, the whole of what Jesus is saying, get it, focus my attention. He's got my attention. And right now, you've got to just be honest with yourself. Has he really got my attention? Or has he, or is my attention drift? And, and we have to be honest with ourselves. And maybe you, for you this evening, you just need to refocus and say, I'm go, I am going to focus on the Lord. I'm going to focus on what he's done. And when we look at Hebrews 1 and 2, these two chapters, Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 2, that's what it does there. It gets you to focus on Jesus. And you've got to think to yourself, you you know, think about it. You know, mankind, we fell away from God. We, We rebelled against God in the garden. We sinned. We disobeyed God. And God could have said, that's enough. But God isn't, has this amazing plan to save you. God is, and the reason he has this plan is because he's full of love. He, he's full of love towards you. And he said, I, I want to redeem you. I want to save you. And he looks, it, you, mu- you must have looked around the, the whole of heaven, isn't it? Like, how am I going to redeem them? In fact, he knows that you were, you were going to be ne- needing saved even before he made you. So you had to put the salvation plan in advance. Because he knew you were going to fall. And he looks, and you think, who does he send? And the Bible says he sends his only son. And you've got to let that sink in. He didn't, he didn't send an angel. He sends his only son to save you. He, he's look, and, he, and you've got to think, how, how much love is there in God that he will send his son? And we read it in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. That Jesus, the, the, the Son of God, is made a little lower than the angels. And you've got to realize, him, Jesus being made a little lower than the angels, that's a big deal. That is a big deal because of where he's, he's come from and who he is. You see, sometimes we, we think that the journey of Jesus was, you know, he come, he, he, the Virgin Mary, a baby, grows up. Um, as, as a man and dies on the cross. But actually, the, the journey of Jesus starts in, starts in heaven. And it says there in Hebrews chapter 1, 4, uh, well, yeah, 1, 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. And it says, he's much superior to the angels as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. So in Hebrews chapter 1, it, it keeps... If you read Hebrews chapter 1, it's like he's doing a comparison. Here's the sun, here's the angels. Here's the sun. And he's saying, look at the difference between the sun and the angels. Look how God speaks to the sun. And look how, how he doesn't speak to the angels like that. And he says of the sun, isn't it? You are my son. Today I've become your father. It wasn't that Jesus was created. Today is always today. It means I've always been your father. And he says, I've never spoken to an angel like that. That's what he says to the church. I've never... He says to you, me, I've never spoken to an angel like that. That Jesus is much, much, like the word much is a lot, isn't it? Like much superior to the angels. So the angels, like to see Jesus, the angels have to go like that and look up to see Jesus. And he's much superior to him. And God says, he he tells all the angels, let all God's angels worship him. 
All, God t- told all the angels, worship Jesus. Think about that. The angels worship him. I don't know. Like you, get, you see bits of what they do in the Bible. They're singing. They're praising. They're, they're saying amazing things. They're, they're worshiping Jesus. Um, and then it says, in, but then it says in chapter 2, now he's become a little lower than the angels. Can you imagine that? They, they, think about that. And why does he do that? Why is Jesus, who's much superior to the angels, I think like when Jesus is, comes down to earth and he's in the virgin's womb, I think all the angels are like that. They start like, the woman that they're looking up and then the next, next time they're looking down. You know, and he's made a, a little lower than the angels. And it's like, they, they all recognize, and like, look, well, look what's just happened. Um, and the Bible says, isn't it, like, he's, he's done that for you. And you've got to think, you know, God wants you, in Hebrews chapter 1, he wants you to know the journey he's taken. He wants you to know this is a big deal. The, the journey that Jesus took for you is a, is a big deal. You know, he, he comes, and think about it, he becomes a baby. He, he goes into the, the, the womb of the Virgin Mary, but also, he think about it, he left heaven. The angels were, were worshipping him. And then all of a, all of a sudden, not as a sudden, they, they, they knew it was on the calendar, but he, he comes down, and now he's like a little lower than the angels. The Bible says that the angels are educated in, what, in God's grace. They're looking and thinking, this is, you, they're stunned. You know, only God has all knowledge and, and has all wisdom. The angels don't have that. They're, they're like, us, I think in that sense of, they're still learning things and, and Grown like that. Um, and you've got to think, that's, you know, who, who did he send to save you? And God talks about this many times in the parables, isn't it? Don't you really, I sent my son to you. I've sent, I've sent the son, isn't it? And it's, sadly, isn't it, when Jesus came, we killed him. <laughs> we crucified him. God knew that was going to happen. It was his plan for it to happen, to save you. But yet we still, that was still our heart. Is that famous verse, that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Think of that. He's, I've, he, you see, he so loved you, he said, I've given my only son. And the angels, all the angels are looking at him. Yes, he, he's given these, the only son uh, to you and to me. And, and it's that, you know, if, if, if you send someone precious, it means it's important, isn't it? If you're going to send someone so precious... And sadly, we never treated him precious, didn't we? We didn't treat him who he was. He was the son of God. You know, um, and Jesus would say that to them. You know, the reason you're not listening to me is actually you don't know the father. But he said, I, he is the son of God. This is, this is God's son. This is a big deal in, um, in heaven. This is a big deal on God's calendar of what has happened. Um, and we are rightly so beginning called to focus on, focus on Jesus. Remember, there's a parable in the book of Mark which talks about a vineyard and it's, it's like the world is a vineyard that God rents out and, and like we're like the ones who have rented the vineyard and God set and he, he, it's a farm really, he rents out this farm to, to these farmers and then the harvest time comes and God sends uh, people to collect the harvest. So it's like talking like us. God, we, this world is rented out to you, basically. You don't, you don't own it. And then God comes to look for the fruit in your life. And it says that he sent servants, he sent people, and that's talking about the prophets in the past. And he sent them, and it says we beat them. But he says these words, he had one left to send. send. So after he'd sent servants, servants after he'd sent uh, the prophets to speak about Jesus, it says... He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. So when God sent Jesus, he, he sent it with the intention, you're gonna, you'll respect him. You'll, you'll recognize who he is. You'll recognize this is the son of God. If you put any, any level below that, you're not seeing Jesus clearly. If you just say teacher, if you just say, you know, he, even if you say just prophet, you, you're seeing him lower than what he is. It, it's, you have to have that revelation like Peter said. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. God has sent his only son. And he, he sent him saying, they will respect him. And he, know, he sent Jesus in it to each one of us. And it says, the son is the radiance of God's glory. In other words, Jesus um, being sent, Jesus dying for you, Jesus rising again, 
shines God's glory to you. This is God's love towards you. He said, this is, this is the power of what God can do. In that, in, in that of who Jesus was, in that story of who Jesus was, l- l- being sent, the whole story, from being sent to dying, to, to, to rising again. He, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. He doesn't say like an angel is the radiance. He doesn't say creation is the radiance of, of God's glory. He says the, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. So everything you see of Jesus, you're saying, I'm seeing the glory of God. Jesus being much superior to the angels, becoming a little lower than the angels in order to save you, isn't it? Because he shares in your humanity. He becomes flesh and blood like you to save you, to rescue. And he's saying, look up. And it's it's, because sometimes we see Jesus at the cross, and we should see Jesus at the cross, but it's it's about seeing that whole journey that he's took in. And and God is saying, Can't you see the journey I've took in for you? Can't you see how how far I'm willing to come to save you and to rescue you? And that's why in chapter two it says, We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift, drift away. And so God is saying, look, this, this is the focus. This is what the angels are focused on. This is what you should be focused on. And ultimately he's saying, do, do you see how important all of this is? You, you might have other things in your calendar. You might have other things. You might think the world's going in this direction and you're this direction. But I tell you, when things start getting wrapped up, when things start coming into line as they are, right according to the Bible, you're going to start saying, oh my, I wish I paid more attention. Because this is what has happened. He ha- the Messiah has come. Think about it. Our whole calendar has been changed based on Jesus coming. Our whole, our whole culture has been changed uh, across the whole world. It has been changed. And, and God is ultimately saying that you, you, it's about you getting on board with what he's doing instead of you saying, God, you get on board with what I'm doing. He's saying, this, is, this has happened. This is what it's about. And he's saying, do you understand the importance of all of this because I think what the Lord is saying to you is you can be a Christian but not focused you can be a Christian but not paying attention it's interesting isn't it with the the tenth the, is it the ten, uh, ten virgin brides isn't it five were foolish five were wise but all of them were asleep weren't they they'd all fallen asleep because it was it was taking so long for Jesus to come it's been 2,000 years it's taken so long for Jesus to return but actually, if you, you look outside, if you read the Bible and you look outside, you, you're actually in that calendar now where it's the last days. And actually in the last days, it's, there's going to be a sign of it is lots of deception, false prophets, false messiahs coming. And actually, the world is ripe now for Christ to return. And you might say, well, it has to be that moment or that moment. No, God sets the time. He knows the time. It could be today. It could be, it could be right now that Jesus could return. And some of, I, I, I don't know, some of you will have the shock of your life, isn't it? But God's in control, isn't it? He, gets, he decides, and he says to us, you must pay more careful attention. I remember there was a, a guy called Kevin. He, he, he doesn't live in South Africa. He works in an area called Swaziland near South Africa. It's changed its name to Estuania. But it's got one of the highest HIV rates in the world. And I mean, p- parents were dying, children were being born with HIV, and, and he started to serve Jesus there. And he felt the Lord guiding them and leading them to, um, he, he, I think they've planted a church there, I think they've done orphanages, I think they've done women's centers, men's centers, uh, to, 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 um, to, to serve Jesus. But at the beginning of the work, it took another man who was doing a work in the UK to speak to this other man. And he, and he just said these words to him, Kevin, I want you to do something. He's like, what, what? Kevin, I want you to focus. I want you to really focus on Jesus. Focus on what Jesus has called you to do. Because you've only got a certain amount of time. And, it, and I think the Bible talks about that, that, realizing the time, realizing who's talking to you, and realizing you can't waste it. You can't waste what he's given to you. And that's hard for us to hear, isn't it? It doesn't mean the Bible says you're saved, but the Bible says only by fire. But what you choose to build with, did I choose to build with the gold and the, and the precious material that he's given me? I heard one person say, what is it that he's given you? It's, it's, 
And they said, it's his heart. He's giving you a taste of his heart. He's giving you a taste of what that heart is, that compassion. That compassion that you feel if you're a believer, it's not your own, it's Christ's. And he's saying, ultimately, how, how do you spend that heart? How do you spend that love? Um, and it, it's, it's saying, okay, I'm going to focus on Jesus. Because ultimately, you can't fix yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't change yourself. But one thing that you can, can all do is just say, I'm going to just look to Jesus. And he, he's saying he is willing to transform us. He's willing to, because the amazing thing, he saves you, but he also keeps you. You know, he's got the keeping power. He can get your heart fixed on what it's, it's meant to be fixed on. And here's, here's the question I want to ask you. What areas with Jesus right now needs more attention? What areas in your life right now, and this is personal to you, isn't it? What areas in Jesus needs more attention? Is it maybe reading the Bible? Maybe, maybe if you just neglected reading the Bible, maybe you say, I just go to the, I just read bits, Bible verses, and I haven't really just soaked in the Word of God. I, I barely read it. I, I, I know everything about any other subject, but when it comes to the Bible, I'm barely, I'm barely reading it. Or I've lost interest, or I've lost attention. Or, and the sad thing is, if you do that, you're, you're susceptible to other things. People, you'll, you'll constantly just let other people tell you what the Bible is about instead of you going to the Bible and saying, I'm going to read this. I'm going to get into the Word of God. I'm going to, I'm going to read the bits that are difficult and I'm going to read the bits that are, are good and I'm going, to just let, I'm going to read the Word of God. And maybe the other, or the other bit needs attention is prayer. You, you've lost the heart to pray. You've lost the need to pray. And I'm not, I'm not praying anymore. I'm not praying about my family. I'm not praying about myself. I'm not, I'm not praying at all. Um, and there's a danger, isn't it, that, that you, you lost the focus in that. You know, Jesus, you're so long in coming away. It's so distant. Nobody, nobody in this world is really trusting you. And you want, you want me to be completely focused when, everybody, when other people are not? You want me to have attention uh, when other people are not? And say, no, I'm going to focus on Jesus. I'm going to keep praying. I'm, Jesus asked, isn't it, when he returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find people saying that? I'm, I'm still trusting you. And maybe um, the other one is fellowship. Other, I know the Lord has been dealing with me in this one about other church members. You, you don't see how precious they are. You don't see how much you need them. You don't, you don't see how much, you know, you think it's just you and Jesus, but you, you've lost that connection with the church, the body. You can't just be connected to the head and not the body, can't you? And you, and you, 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 you barely scrape and by of understanding what it is about anymore. And you say, no, Lord, I want to have that. I want that restored in my heart. It's so important to you that you need each other. And maybe, or maybe it's serving. Maybe you say, I'm just here to attend. I'm, I'm just here to, to show face. But to have the heart to serve, I, I don't give it any attention. I, I'm just autopilot. I'm in autopilot. And you'll get what you get out of me and that'll be it. Then God's saying, you see, focusing on Jesus is about all of those things. I'm going to, I'm going to serve him. I'm going to, you know, when, once he's got your attention, that's it. You're, the Bible calls it like, the, uh, calls it like you're fixed. It's like you're locked. You're locked into Christ. You're locked into to, to having that heart to, to serve him. Um, or maybe it's a heart for the lost. And I think we can all feel like that, isn't it? The Bible says that because the wickedness will increase, the love of many is going to grow cold. Because there's so many offences out there. There's so many things that can offend you. You're almost like, you're, you're scrubbing your hands and saying, I'm done with this generation. And the sad thing is, God's not yet. When he has, he, everything's going to be wrapped up. But until that happens, you, you've got to still say, I've got to still be able to show mercy to a wicked generation. I've got to still be able to show that there's hope, that there's, there's mercy. And, and God's saying, does that need more attention in your life? Are you going to focus on these things? Because when Jesus comes back, all of these things are going to come right into sharp, sharp focus again. Um, and it says there, for since the mess, verse 2, since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such great a salvation? So obviously before, isn't it like, what is the things that need that attention? 
And what you're going to, and when you get to 65, you're going to say, well, was it worth it? Was it worth it that I, I neglected the Bible so much? Was it worth it that I neglected praying so much? Was it worth it that I neglected serving the Lord so much? And because Jesus then says, look, this, this message is binding. This is reinforced. He said, God said, look, this is, this is serious business. This is, this is heaven or hell. This is where souls get, div- um, the sheep and the goat get divided. These, these are serious things in heaven. This is about the souls of men and women, isn't it? This, these, are, these are the very f- things and fabric of the, the human being deciding here. God said, this is serious stuff. And, and not only is it serious stuff, isn't it? it? It's serious love. You know, God sent his son and look what we've done to him. Look, but look also what he's done for you. Look how he's come to rescue you and your life the whole of your future, the whole of heaven and hell, heaven and hell depends on how you treat the Son. Have I received Him or have I rejected Him? And obviously, us as being saved, isn't it? We we've turned to Him and we've asked for mercy, like Psalm two, isn't it? Kiss the Son, lest He be angry. And I'm saying He is the one. He's the one um, installed in God's holy hill. He is that one in Zion. He is the Messiah. He is that revelation and saying, God, I, I want to follow Jesus. I'm, if all the angels are focused on him now, if, if I don't want to get to when he, when he returns and all of a sudden I'm having to do such a sharp focus and refocus everything. And everything else was just, was, was nothing. And God said, look, this is, this is serious business. He says, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? You know, you, you, you got the best. You got Jesus. You got God's heart you've you've gotten such an, a great salvation you can't ask for anything better you can't ask for anything more he's given you his only son and god saying right now pay it pay more careful attention to him focus your whole you're not going to waste your life if you just give it all to jesus you will be so fulfilled you will be so satisfied you will be so you'll never regret it serving Jesus with all of your life being f- and, say, and fighting through what you need to do to focus on him, to serve him, to keep loving. Even when around you, others might not be loving, you're saying, but I know his heart. I know that he is loving. I know that he is kind and I know that he's, he saves. And it says, how shall we escape if we ignore such great salvation? Ask yourself this. What is, what is next for those who reject Jesus? What comes next. Sometimes we don't like to talk about it. What's next for people that don't, don't trust Jesus, reject Jesus? The Bible says there's a hell. There is an eternal punishment. And just as much as you love that eternal salvation, the Bible says there's a hell. There is a, there's a cutoff point. And, and God is saying, think about it. Let me just use a part from the Bible in Genesis 19. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah got more and more wicked. And it says the wickedness went up to God. And God says that, that this is enough. And he sends the angels, doesn't he? And he goes in to save Lot and his family. Lot is somebody that chooses to live in the wrong place. And he goes in to, to save Lot and his family. And, he, and the angels basically say to Lot, look, get out of here. This destruction is coming. It's time to get out. It's time. In other words, Lot, it's time to focus attention. You need to get out. I need to, you to be focused, Lot. It's time to get out. It's time to turn, and you need to get out of this place. And it's interesting that the angels went, and it says it was getting to dawn, and Lot was still not leaving. And it says that Lot went to his son-in-laws. He had son-in-laws that were committed to marrying his daughters. And it says he talked to the son-in-laws and said, look, it's time, we need to get out of here. God's going to bring judgment. And it says that the son-in-laws just thought they were joking. See, that's one of the ways people ignore it. They just thought, they were laughing. And the, the, that's one of the ways that it ignores. And it, it says that even Lot began to hesitate. Lot began to, began to like, you know, I don't know whether he's like looking back or here, but he begins to hesitate. And it says the angels actually grab the hands of Lot and the family and start pulling them out. And, saying, and it ticks them so far. And then they say to Lot and the family, right, you now go. You've got to go. This place is going to have destruction. And it says... When he hesitated, the band, which are the angels, grasped his, his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out the city, for the Lord was merciful to him. So he leads them out the city and then he says, right, now you need to go all the way, Lot. You've got to go all the way. But what does it say? When they were going, Lot's wife looks back. 
She's, she's going, she's leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, and she looks back. And the Bible says she turns into a pillar of salt. You see, because she wanted sin. She wanted that sinful life. She wanted wickedness. That turning back wasn't just like, like you turn back and then boom, you're gone. Like some sort of game. It was, that's what her, what her heart was like. And God's saying, this is serious business. This is serious love. Isn't, there's no turning back. You know, you turning back. You, the, the, the Israelites want to come out of Egypt and they, and they want to go back to Egypt. And God says, there's no turning back. You'll die if you go back. It's that serious. You'll die. There's nothing to go back to. And, but the good thing is, isn't it, that the gospel, just focus on Jesus, turn to him. You see, what the Bible is asking, you need to pay careful attention to what has God's attention. And sometimes, isn't it, ask yourself this question, are you trying to get Jesus to focus on what you want, or has Jesus got you focused on what he wants? And he, he's the one that's going to transform your heart. And the good news, just to end with these couple of verses here, but the good news, isn't it? The Lord is mindful of you. The Lord cares about you. Isn't it? What is man that you're mindful of him? And in verse 9, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death with for everyone. And the Bible says, isn't it, that everything's been put under Jesus' feet. He's in control. There was a, a very controversial vision. That David Wilson, a preacher, he gave a vision all about the future. And basically saying the world is going to spin out of control. The world is in fire. But he had that word, God has everything under control. He, everything is getting put under the feet of Jesus. It might look like everything is spinning out of control, but God is in control. He has the power. He has the authority. All glory, all honor, all dominion belongs to, to God. And you will do well just say, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. And the amazing thing is, isn't it? The Bible says you can see him. You can see Jesus. You can walk looking at Jesus. You can look, walk thinking of Jesus, looking to him. You can see him, isn't it? Seek first the kingdom of God and his, his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. And that's what I'm asking. Just focus your... The Bible doesn't talk, it talks about that constantly. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And ask yourself, am I going to do that right now? Am I going to just say, I'm going to fix, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to fix my thoughts on Jesus Christ. Because he is the Messiah. That makes all the difference. He's the son of God. He is the living one. He is the one that's came down from heaven to earth. He is the one it's all about. And, I'm, and you're making that choice. And he's saying, right, will you, will you focus on Jesus right now? Are you just going to fix your eyes on him? And so let's pray now that we do that as a church. Let's be a church that has our eyes really firmly fixed on the Lord. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord God, that you do not disappoint. Lord, you do not put to shame. We will not be disappointed. Lord God, we may have to go through fire. We may have to go through flood. We may have to go through such opposition, Lord God, but we will not be disappointed by fixing our eyes on Jesus, Lord. And let us ask ourselves, Lord God, who else are we going to fix it on? Who else are we going to give such attention to, Lord God? So please help us now as a church, Lord God. It's how we're going to be able to love each other as a, as a church family. It's how we're going to be able to forgive. It's how we're going to be able to not have bitterness in our heart. It's how we're going to be able to serve with joy and love. It's just by fixing our eyes on Jesus. So Lord, help us now just to have our eyes fixed on the Lord, Lord God. Please help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to st uh, stand and sing our last song.
we can raise our hands. And this is what later on in Hebrews chapter 12 says this. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Thank you. 